Now that the age of unleaded avgas is all but upon us, let the question and whispers begin. I get this one a lot. Maybe not every week, but probably once a month. Let's say your Cirrus engine is timed out and barely wheezed through the last compression check. So now you got to invest, what, 40 to 50 grand on a new or overhauled engine. Before you top off with your first batch of unleaded avgas, you're going to want some assurances that it will perform just like 100 low lead does and that it won't do something weird like turn the oil into sulfuric acid or hammer the valves to useless junk in 50 hours. <laughs> well, I'm just the guy not to give you those assurances because there's always some risk in big transitions like this and there could be surprises. Having said that, however, there's no good data to suggest that unleaded aviation gasoline won't perform just like the leaded version we've been using for 80 years, and there's plenty of evidence that it will. Still, you will hear whispers that unleaded avgas might damage engines by causing valve seat recession. There's some basis for this worry, and it goes all the way back to 1960s automobiles, which did in fact suffer valve seat recession when unleaded car gas was introduced and was eventually required at the behest of the Environmental Protection Agency. Let's take a look at the mechanics and physics, and I'll use my generic valve train cartoon here. And by the way, seat recession applies only to the exhaust valve. When unleaded car gas was coming on the market in the 1970s and 1980s, several research projects investigated the impact, including a big one by Phillips, the research showed that valve seat damage was a real thing all right, caused by a two-fold mechanism, material transfer followed by abrasion. And this happened only with unleaded fuels. First, it was believed that iron oxide flakes collected on the valve seat and were transferred to the mating surfaces when the valve seated by the force of combustion. This is sometimes called micro-welding. This caused plastic deformation of the valve and turned it into a sort of a grinding wheel. Further combustion accelerated the wear and the study found that worst case, the valve was tanked in about 80 hours of operation. Eventually the seat wears to the point that the valve won't fully seat and it can't transfer its heat to the larger mass of the cylinder head, so it burns up. Another research project by Unical found that the Valve rotators commonly used on the engines of that vintage made valve seat recession a lot worse, probably because the valve head became a more effective abrasive tool as it rotated. Makes sense, I guess. All of the studies found that valve seat recession applied only to older cars made mostly before the early 1970s. But at the time, Phillips estimated as many as 70 million engines of various types could be affected. Newer cars made from the early 1970s forward had either induction-hardened cylinder heads or harder valve seat inserts. What was less clear is why valve seat recession happened in the first place. The Phillips study said, without supporting data, that lead deposits served as a lubricant to prevent micro-welding and reduce wear on valve seats. It is true that lead oxide, actually monoxide, finds limited use in greases and as a dry lubricant. But any aircraft owner who's had a valve stick, as I have, will tell you lead deposits don't do the guides a bit of good. If you're lucky, you can nudge it loose with the rope trick, but if it spins out of control, lead deposits aren't lubricating anything other than the exhaust port on your checkbook. I call this the pixie dust theory. Some people, somehow, want to believe that when Robert Midgley figured out tetraethyl lead was a great kick-ass octane enhancer, he also knew it was some kind of magic lubricant that would protect valves, seats, and guides, like pixie dust. Phillips never explored the chemical and physical aspects of the problem because, well, there was no reason to. Oil companies are happy to go all sciencey if there's money to be made, but if not, Hey, let's just get back to boiling the planet. They observed valve seat recession and led to the conclusion that lead had protective qualities. They did not control for other confounders like how peak cylinder pressures and combustion stability may affect valve wear. These are different between leaded and unleaded fuels. 
In support of the pixie dust theory, Phillips did conclude that some kind of additive would protect against valve wear, and that one option was, wait for it, to add lead in the field. This would, of course, defeat the purpose of unleaded fuel, so it never amounted to much in the U.S. In further support of the pixie dust theory, a research project in Thailand duplicated the Phillips results, finding that, yes indeed, engines with soft valve seats would trash them in short order when operated on unleaded fuel. But the Thai study actually did test some additive, one potassium-based and one sodium-based. These were somewhat effective in preventing valve seat recession and were added to premium unleaded fuels. And that brings us full circle to your $50,000 Cirrus engine. What's the likelihood of valve recession when you start burning 100 octane unleaded fuel? Guys at General Aviation Modifications who developed and got approved the first 100 octane unleaded aviation fuel, that's G100 UL, say it's zero. No chance of valve seat recession. They're backing that up with about 700 hours of test cell and flight testing with numerous checks for seat recession along the way. And by the way, Checking for valve seat recession wasn't a specific part of the formal FAA test program, but routine disassembly and wear measurements were. And there's a reason valve seat wear wasn't singled out. The FAA foresaw this as an issue more than 30 years ago because, well, they read the SAE papers too. So in 1989, the agency commissioned an unleaded fuel test in which a pair of Lycoming 320s were mounted in test stands. One was operated on commercially available premium unleaded automotive fuel, the other on standard 100 low-lead autogas. The test tried to duplicate the usual aircraft operating cycle, including startup, warm-up, taxi, and so forth. They did exhaust gas monitoring and oil analysis throughout the 150-hour test runs to assure that the engines were run consistently. Any surprises? Not really. Well, maybe one. The engine burning unleaded autogas actually had minutely less valve seat recession than the engine burning leaded avgas. Here are the actual numbers. But these differences were too trivial to mean anything. One thing that was not a surprise is that because Lycoming had already switched to hardened valve seats in the 1970s and 1980s, no recession was expected and none was found. From this test and GAMI certification work, we can thus leap to the confident conclusion that unleaded fuel won't cause valve seat recession in aircraft engines, right? Not so fast. As recently as 10 years ago, Continental had this statement on its website with regard to using unleaded auto fuels in its engines. Unacceptable wear in 10 hours? That bulletin seems to have disappeared from the site, and it did refer to autogas, but unleaded is unleaded. And anyway, surely by now, all Continental engines, like Lycoming's, have hardened valve seats and have had for years, right? Well, not exactly. Continental told us that improved valve seats have been available only since 2019, which means that the vast majority of Continental engines in the field don't have them, including new Cirrus aircraft made before then. Next question, has Continental seen valve seat recession in its testing? Yes, the company says it has when it was testing unleaded fuels during the FAA's Aborted Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative, or PAFI, around 2017. Continental wouldn't say which fuels they tested, nor would the FAA offer any information on the PAFI findings at all. As far as we know, there were only two fuels at the time, one from Shell and one from Swift, both 100 octane. The FAA won't provide any detail on any of this, citing federal procurement rules. We have been told from sources familiar with the testing that one of the PAFI fuels trashed the lubricating oil in under 50 hours, and according to Continental, at least one caused significant valve seat recession at the 700 hour mark. If that was related to oil, they aren't saying. But Continental did say it never got around to improved hardened valve seats because customers hadn't expressed an interest. But wait, there's more. And it makes things really kind of murky. If Continental found valve seat recession with the PAFI unleaded fuels, 
This apparently was not an issue in certifying this engine in 2010. It's the TSI 0550K. It's approved to burn UL94, which is essentially 100 low lead without the octane boosting lead. In 2015, responding to what appeared to be vague market demand for unleaded fuel, Continental announced this engine, the IO360AF, AF meaning alternative fuel, and that means both 91 and UL94 unleaded fuels. Continental is also approving UL94 for a range of other smaller displacement engines from the 0200 to the 0360 and the 0470 series. Swift Fuel, which makes UL94, has a list of approved Continental engines on its website. All of these were approved before Continental introduced improved valve seats in 2019, so presumably there are no issues with valve seat wear using that fuel. Worth mentioning is the Swedish company Helmco. They've been supplying unleaded aviation fuel for years in Europe with no apparent issues that we know of. So where does Gammy's G100 UL fit into this puzzle? Gammy sent Continental several drums of G100 UL in 2010, where they sat for two years untouched. Continental never tested the fuel and says it has no plans to test it. It doesn't list G100 UL as an approved fuel. Not that this really matters because Gammy has supplemental type certificates that approve all of Continental spark ignition engines to use G100 UL. Same is true for Lycoming engines. Lycoming hasn't tested G100 UL either, but Embry-Riddle did a long-term test in its Cessna 172 fleet. All Lycoming engines are approved to use G100 UL under Gammy's STCs. Confused yet? This is just another bus stop on the chaotic road to an unleaded future. Lycoming saw this coming years ago and all of its engines have hardened valve seats that aren't likely to be susceptible to valve seat wear. Lycoming itself is happy with unleaded fuels in its engines that can burn UL94 and Swiss has its own list of approved Lycoming engines. Where does this leave Continental then? The only public data we have is the FAA unleaded test with Lycoming engines. The fact that Continental approved the TSI 0550K and the IO 360 AF for unleaded fuel implies that even without the new hardened valve seats, seat recession on unleaded fuel isn't a risk, at least not much of one. Gammy's own test data backs this up. Also, while Swiss UL94 doesn't have wide national distribution yet, users report no issues with valve seat recession that we know of and neither does Swift. So to answer the reader's original question, is valve seat wear a worry here? On Lycoming engines, it's hard to see how. On Continental engines, we have anecdotal declarations from auto fuel experience years ago that were never documented, and we have Continental's report on its PAFI testing that's proprietary. We do know that whatever fuel caused that Continental valve wear was not an approvable fuel because it failed the PAFI certification test. Bottom line, what testing we can confirm shows that valve seat recession doesn't appear to be a thing with unleaded fuels. That's not to say wider use of it won't reveal some surprises, but for now, it doesn't look like it. And given that getting to an unleaded aviation fuel has been a 40-year cluster, that's as close to a take-it-to-the-bank recommendation as we're likely to get. For AbWeb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching.